Warning: Silver salts are slightly toxic and may tarnish your skin when touched. Concentrated sulfuric acid is extremely corrosive. Sulfur dioxide is toxic. Sodium hydroxide is very corrosive. Buying silver or silver compounds may hurt your wallet. Hi guys, here is MIH. In a few weeks, I will finish ninth grade and say goodbye to my classmates. So I wanted to hand out a few chemistry-based gifts. The first thing that came to my mind was copper and silver mineral reactions, since they are known to be very easily prepared and, more importantly, extremely beautiful. However, the silver mineral reaction requires a silver salt. Most commonly, this salt is silver nitrate, but since nitrates are explosive, silver nitrate isn't widely available. Moreover, silver salts are much, much more expensive than silver metal alone. Therefore, making silver salts from silver metal and use that to make a silver mirror seems to be a viable option to me. The normal procedure to make silver salts would be dumping a piece of silver metal in some nitric acid, forming silver nitrate and nitrogen oxides. The reaction is simple, but nitrogen oxides are very toxic, while nitric acid is somewhat hard to get. I did some research and found out that concentrated sulfuric acid can readily dissolve silver metal when hot, forming silver sulfate and sulfur dioxide. Fortunately, I just bought a bottle of concentrated sulfuric acid drink cleaner, so I'm good to go. Alright, here is my gram of silver. It is very shiny because it is sealed in an ampule filled with inert gases. Let's take a minute and observe its beauty. Alright, now I'm gonna smash it to get the silver out. Take that. I wrapped the ampule in a piece of tissue paper. I then gently tapped the ampule with a hammer until it cracked. The silver is then picked out as one whole piece. I set up a simple heating apparatus consisting of a test tube and an alcohol lamp. I filled the test tube with a little bit of my sulfuric acid drain cleaner. You can see that it is slightly colored with impurities, so I'm going to try and remove it first. The easiest way to do this is to heat the acid up. I ignited my alcohol lamp and heated the acid. Because I am worried about the sulfur dioxide, I moved outside, so the wind was blowing the flame away, and it took a really long time to heat up. A few minutes later, the acid started changing color, first to yellow, then brown, and finally black. The hot concentrated sulfuric acid is an extremely strong oxidizer and oxidizes the organic pigments to carbon and carbon dioxide while producing sulfur dioxide and water. A few moments later, the acid turned paler in color and it started giving off white acid fumes which indicates that it is almost boiling. Be careful and do not inhale those acid fumes as they are very dangerous and potentially carcinogenic. Because the wind is getting very big outside, I decided to move back in. As a safety precaution, I placed a piece of paper tissue soaked in sodium hydroxide solution at the top of the test tube. This will absorb the sulfur oxide gases and protect me. I cranked up the heat and the sulfuric acid started boiling quickly while releasing a lot of acid fumes. It should be noted with importance that sulfuric acid has a huge tendency to boil unevenly and violently when heated to high temperatures. So when the acid stops bubbling suddenly for a few seconds, you must remove the heating. The acid may boil violently and crack the test tube, destroying everything near it, including your hand. The paper towel soaked in sodium hydroxide was working pretty well, and I can only see a little bit of fumes released out. Because the boiling became a serious issue, I added some glass fragments to the acid. This sort of worked, but it didn't work as well as I wished it to be. Note that normal zeolite or porcelain cannot be used, as it will be decomposed by the acid. After heating for about 10 minutes, the color of the acid didn't disappear, so I decided to just proceed on. I carefully dropped in my piece of silver, and it reacted very very vigorously even without external heating. It releases a large amount of gas, mainly sulfur dioxide, along with a little bit of water vapor and sulfur trioxide. The sodium hydroxide towel proved to hold up perfectly. A minute later, the reaction slowed down a bit, so I restarted the heating to get it going again. As I said before, boiling hot concentrated sulfuric acid is an extremely powerful oxidizer, and it can oxidize silver to form silver sulfate, silver dioxide, and water. The poorly soluble silver sulfate 
then reacts with excess sulfuric acid to form silver hydrogen sulfate, which can readily dissolve in the concentrated sulfuric acid. By the way, hot concentrated sulfuric acid can dissolve all metals, except for a few metals in the lower transition series, such as tungsten. Even lead, which has an insoluble sulfate, can dissolve in concentrated sulfuric acid, forming lead hydrogen sulfate, just like silver. When the acid is heated to boiling temperatures, the reaction takes off, and huge amounts of gas is released, along with considerable amounts of acid fumes. The silver metal disappeared very quickly, and within only 10 minutes, the last bit of silver dissolved. After the sulfuric acid cooled for a bit, I took the test tube off the stand and poured its contents into about 60 milliliters of cold water. A milky white precipitate immediately crashes out. This is hopefully our silver sulfate, which is only slightly soluble in water. Be careful during this step as the concentrated sulfuric acid releases a lot of heat when mixed with water. You should never do the reverse and pour the water into the concentrated sulfuric acid. I let the mixture settle for a bit. It was slightly yellow, probably due to the impurities in the sulfuric acid. I decanted off the upper water layer. It was still a bit murky though, as some of the salts didn't settle to the bottom. I will add sodium chloride to this solution later to recover the silver. In the beaker, we are left with some nearly pure silver sulfate, ready to be converted to a beautiful silver mirror. I then prepared the mirror substrates. Many people prefer glass vials since they are cheap and sealable, but I don't have any on hand. I decided to plate the mirror directly on 4 watch glass pieces, which should create a nice spherical surface mirror, and when larger, even capable of focusing sunlight and igniting a match. I plan to do one of those large mirrors later. I place those watch glasses in a solution of hot concentrated sodium hydroxide. This will wash out the greases on the watch glasses, which should be minimal since they are brand new. After about 5 minutes, I took them out and washed off the sodium hydroxide with some water. Now I can prepare my silver mirror reagents. I made a roughly 5% ammonia solution by diluting some concentrated ammonia and slowly added it to a solution of the silver sulfate, made from about 0.2 grams of the salt and 10 milliliters of water. Interestingly, the solution cleared up instead of forming precipitates. Since silver sulfate is poorly soluble in water, the amount of silver ions in the solution is very little, which explains why it didn't form precipitates. Instead, the ammonia directly dissolved the silver sulfate to form diamine silver ions. This is called the tolerance reagent, and it is a mild oxidizer. We can then react it with a mild reducer, such as an aldehyde, to make silver metal, which will deposit on the surface of the container as a silver mirror. The aldehyde for choice here is glucose, since it is cheap and non-toxic. I measure out 3 grams of glucose monohydrate and dissolve it in about 30 milliliters of water. I pour about 10 milliliters of the tolerance region in both of the watch glasses and poured about 10 milliliters of the glucose solution in both of them. Contrary to what I expected, nothing happened, even after half an hour, while many other people are finished within 20 minutes. I am really worried if the reaction even worked, or if the white powder we made earlier is actually silver sulfate. To my relief, a definite mirror formed on the next morning. It wasn't especially perfect, and the color was a bit tarnished, which made it less reactive than expected, but I think that made it look quite beautiful in some way. Delighted by the success, I decided to make two more watch glass mirrors using the same recipe but double the concentration. This time, I noticed that the glucose cooled the water down considerably when it dissolved in the water, which is probably why the reaction is proceeding very slowly. I also decanted off the solution in the two finished mirrors and filled in some new ones, which should make it shinier and more polished. Here are some pictures showing the growth of the mirrors. 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, and 150 minutes. The mirror formed slowly but surely, and on the last picture, there are already some reflective bits of silver. Because I have a bunch of silver solution left over, I decided to do three more runs, which are two test tubes and a plastic petri dish. All three were prepared the exact same way with the two new mirrors. 
The leftover silver in the solutions were effectively recycled by adding some sodium chloride solution, which precipitates the silver as silver chloride. This can be then dissolved in ammonia to make the Tarlins reagent again. However, be careful storing silver chloride as it easily decomposes back to silver when exposed to light. Anyways, I think this first trial of the famous silver mirror reaction ended up in brilliant success, although with some trips and falls. I feel great that I successfully recreated such a beautiful and famous reaction, and that gives me confidence to try something harder next time, like a copper mirror. See you soon!